as tonight's story is not so much a story about syphilis as it is a story about a man who lived 400 years ago who it put a word into our collective minds and made it stick there for centuries. Now, syphilis during that time period was a pretty big problem because it was untreatable and it made your nose rot off. And this is a prosthetic nose, circa 16th, 17th century, that people would use to hide the unsightly defect. And uh, this right here is an early grafting um, technique to fix your nose after the leprosy-like impact of untreated syphilis. So, when syphilis swept the continent in 1495, it didn't have a name, which I think made it probably a lot scarier. And people called it the French disease or the great pox um, because to differentiate from smallpox. And um, it, they, the reason they called it the French disease or the Neapolitan disease was because when the French soldiers invaded Naples, that's when the first outbreak occurred. And this went on. Um, syphilis was called the French disease in Italy, Poland, and Germany, the Italian disease in France, and so on. So pretty much if we hate you, you gave us syphilis. <laughs> Super fun. Which leads us to some questions that you may not have thought to ask. Um, what is the origin of the word syphilis, and when did we first start calling it syphilis? And this is actually where our real story starts, and I give you Verona in 1530. Um, <laughs> stage fright. <laughs> Here's our real hero. Girolamo Fracastro. And this is a painting done by Titian, which the historical rumor is that Titian actually had syphilis and that he exchanged this portrait for treatment. Now, uh, Fracastro was a doctor, and doctors in 1530 were not the most highly respected of people. Um, part of this was because astrology was sort of the governing paradigm. And while they knew that syphilis was a sexually transmitted disease, they didn't quite understand what happened, like after you screwed someone, how you got screwed. And so this is a picture of um, a syphilitic patient, um, and it's, it's attributing the cause to astrology. So Fracastro's theory was kind of like booed by the other doctors, and it was this idea that there were these little fomites, that things, these little atoms, or they didn't have that word, you know, would stick to your clothes and they'd get to somebody else. And so Fracastro had this problem, and it's a postmodern problem, you know, like, how do I make my tweets go viral? Um, so Fracastro had this idea, like, how do I make my germ theory go viral. So we're going to stop for a second and I'm going to give you my English 101 little lecture. Genre is what is the best form in which to shape and spread an idea? That's genre. And rhetoric is a question that we've all asked. How do I get people to see the world the way that I do? And then finally, um, technology. And technology is a dictic term, which means that its meaning changes based on what it's referring to. So technology could be this microphone, technology could be this lovely laptop, technology could be a pencil. And sometimes genre and technology get blurred or combined in interesting ways. Um, you know, so Twitter, for example, is a technology and it's also a genre. So Fracastro's choice was unusual for doctors. Doctors did not go around writing epic poems, but Fracastro, to spread his ideas about germ theory, wrote an epic poem that starred an unlikely hero, a shepherd, wait for it, named Syphilis. And Syphilis somehow angered Apollo, the god Apollo, and Apollo struck him down with a horrific disease, and that, my friends, is where we get the name syphilis. So you might be wondering what the point of all of this is. <laughs> Great story, Jen. But Fracastro's rhetorical risk paid off. His image is now ensconced in stone. 
His ideas gave way to germ theory, and now we still call syphilis. It's firmly entrenched in our minds. Thank you.